Thank you very much. I'm very pleased and honored to be here. I uh, understand that I am the first conservative speaker to be speaking at Lock Haven in living memory. <laughs> uh, This, in case you haven't figured out, is not a good thing. Uh, universities are supposed to be about exchange, debate, discussion, facts. Um, I'm going to be speaking about some controversial topics, but I think you'll see I'm going to speak about them in a measured, commonsensical, and heavily factual way. Um, if you want to protest or walk out, you can. But I would urge you to wait until you hear something that is actually hateful. Because sometimes people get whipped up into a frenzy. Oh, there's a hate speaker going to campus. And the hate never happens. It's purely abstract. It's in, you may say, in the propaganda, but not in anything the speaker says. So I'm actually here to have a discussion and uh, a dialogue. And if you leave, not only will you not hear from me, but I won't have a chance to hear from you. So that's not good either. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an immigrant from India. I came to the United States uh, at the age of 17. Um, I still remember walking off the airplane and. JFK, I had uh, $500 in my pocket, and I knew that if I stayed in America, that's all I would have to make it in a new country. And yet, uh, as I set foot in America, I had this strange feeling of, of excitement, of, you may say, moving from the margin of the world to the, to the center. I had this feeling that I was coming to a country in which I could be in a way that I wouldn't be able to be anywhere else, an architect of my own destiny. I want, I've always wanted to live a life in which I can be in the driver's seat of my own future. And America offered me this kind of promise. promise. In some ways, I would say I've lived the American dream, but I also want you to know I've lived the American nightmare. Uh, I stood in a courtroom a few years ago and I heard a bailiff bark out the words, United States of America versus Dinesh D'Souza. I was in a federal case in which dozens of FBI agents were assigned to go through my bank records, my tax returns, read every word I ever wrote, with the goal of locking me up in federal prison for two years. So I've seen the best of America. Uh, I've also seen the ways in which America sucks. <laughs> and my patriotism has had to reconcile these two opposites. Now, my topic for this evening is diversity, multiculturalism, and uh, these are topics that are naturally of interest to me, and yet they are topics that are puzzling at the same time. I remember feeling this puzzlement literally weeks after I set foot on the Dartmouth campus, uh, a year after I did high school in America, in Arizona. Uh, I uh, was admitted to Dartmouth, I went to school in New Hampshire, and one of the first things I encountered was you may say, multiculturalism in its very early form. And one of my professors, I remember saying that multiculturalism is the idea that all cultures are basically equal. No culture is, is better or worse. No culture is superior or inferior. And I thought to myself, this for me is extremely strange because if all cultures were truly equal, I can't think of why someone would get up and move from one culture to another. In other words, if you think of what the immigrant is doing, 
I'm not talking about the refugee. I'm talking about the immigrant who voluntarily relinquishes one society and migrates by choice to another. Now, why would the immigrant do that? I mean, we are all naturally attached to our own community. I was attached to my own school, my family, my friends. My whole world was over there. And so I said to myself, isn't it, doesn't it seem that immigration is a walking refutation of cultural relativism? Because the immigrant is voting with his or her feet in the most decisive way possible against your own culture to which you have a natural affinity. And why would you move to another culture if you did not think that this other culture on the balance is going to be better, is going to offer you a better life than you could get over there. So I just want you to get the feeling for how from a young age I have had to reconcile these kind of, you may call them nostrums of diversity, I've had to reconcile them with my own experience, with my own experience. Now, the most important kind of diversity in a university is diversity of mind, diversity of ideas. Other forms of diversity are important, by and large, to the degree that they lead to this. So they are subordinate to the intellectual diversity, which is the essence of a university. And what I want to argue is that this intellectual diversity is in very short supply. Not only that, but the invocations of other forms of diversity are mobilized against it. In other words, the invocation of diversity is, it then generates a whole series of ideas, safe spaces, this is offensive, that, that upsets me, and so intellectual diversity finds itself being crowded out by people who's, who take offense. They take offense. Now they take offense to what? To what? We could have a whole theoretical debate tonight about hate speech. If, you know, several years ago when the Nazis marched through Skokie, the ACLU had a difficult decision about whether or not to defend the Nazis' right to free speech. If a Nazi were coming to speak at Lock Haven, you could have a very interesting debate about the margins of the First Amendment and to what, but that is not the debate we're having now. That's not the debate we're having now. The debate we're going to have now is that I'm about to tell you a whole bunch of things that you will find kind of shocking. You shouldn't. You should actually know them. The good news is, you don't have to take my word for anything I say. And in the age of the internet, you can check me out on Google in 10 seconds. So if I say anything that is even debatable, you will find out immediately. So I'm going to stay on extremely safe ground and tell you nothing that is even historically debatable. I'm going to tell you stuff that is straight out fact. And I want to assure you that these facts that you're about to hear will shock you to your core. And they will make you feel unsafe. Why? Because your professors have been lying to you. They have been lying to you. They have been suppressing the facts I'm about to tell you. And so the facts I'm about to tell you will therefore make you uncomfortable which will then get your professors to say that I'm creating an unsafe environment even though the only unsafety that you're facing is the unsafety of truth itself. Of truth itself. So the question really is, do you have courage? Are you willing to hear me out? I'm willing to hear you out. And let's see who has the truth on their side. Now, we have a bunch of guys going around, right as we speak, knocking down Confederate statues in the American South. Because the Confederate statues are a monumental reminder of a horrible legacy. A horrible legacy of American and Southern racism and slavery and racial oppression and racial terrorism. 
And then we have, going on at right about the same time, the NFL controversy about taking a knee and a refusal to come out for the national anthem. And again, if you think about it, the rationale is kind of the same. That the American anthem and America, rah rah America, represents a lot of bad things that America did that seem to have been swept under the rug. So in doing patriotism, aren't we giving tribute to those bad things that we don't want to endorse? Now, this is when the debate gets really interesting. Because when we look at those Confederate statues, we have to ask ourselves, was the slavery debate between the North and the South? And my answer to that question is no. The secession debate was, in fact, between the North and the South. The South seceded. True. But the slavery debate was much older. The slavery debate went way back. The slavery debate, to some degree, went back to the founding. But it certainly intensified in the decades leading up to the Civil War. Who was the slavery debate between? The reason we know it was not between the North and the South is first, most Southerners did not own slaves. Most Confederates did not own slaves. But, and here's the really interesting point, the Northern Democrats protected slavery with the same cunning zeal as the Southern Democrats. When Abraham Lincoln identified a troika of bad guys who were defending slavery, two of them, the President, James Buchanan, from this state, was from the North. And the other was Stephen Douglas, the senator from Illinois. Two of the three, the third was Roger Tawney, who wrote the Dred Scott decision. Two of the slavery defenders were Northerners. So right away we see that there's a kind of wrinkle in the ointment of the idea that the slavery debate was North-South. I want to suggest that the slavery debate was, in fact, a debate between the pro-slavery Democratic Party and the anti-slavery Republican Party. Now, when I say this on campus, inevitably, a professor will stand up and say, Dinesh, you're being very simplistic. You can't make these neat divisions between the parties. Surely you've got to remember there was a great deal of blame to go around. Actually, no. No. In 1860, 1860, the year before the Civil War, no Republican owned a slave. Let me repeat myself. No Republican owned a slave. All the slaves in the United States, of which there were at the time four million, were owned by Democrats. Now, when I first said this a year ago, it created a big sensation, and hundreds of researchers went to the, hit the books, and if you think about it, I'm making a kind of a scientific statement, right? I'm making a statement that is verifiable, refutable. All you have to do is give me a list of five Republicans who own slaves, and I would have to take it back. But to date, I want to assure you that no one has given me a single counterexample. None. One guy, after months of research, goes, you know what, Dinesh, I gotcha. Ulysses S. Grant inherited a slave on his wife's side. And I go, that's true. But when that happened, Ulysses S. Grant was a Democrat. He had not yet moved over to the Republican Party, which he did later. Now, the reason this is important, the reason this is important is, let's, let's, let's back up for just a second. Slavery is a very old institution. And the reason that the American founders allowed it in the Constitution, in the Union, is there was no other way to get a Union. Lincoln understood this, as did Frederick Douglass. And for Lincoln and Douglass, the founders treated slavery as an evil to be tolerated out of necessity until you could get rid of it. For the Democrats of the 19th century, slavery became a positive good. 
Not even talking about the Southern Democrats. Let's look at Stephen Douglas, the leader of the Democratic Party who ran against Abraham Lincoln, not just for the Senate, but then for the presidency. Stephen Douglas wanted slavery in America to be forever. He wanted slavery to be permanent. He said, let every state, let every territory decide for itself if it wants slaves. And if his way was, was successful, that would be the case now. Every state would be deciding now if we wanted to have slavery or not. This was the Democratic Party's official position in the 1860 election. And you might say, well, Dinesh, all right, I get you. But isn't this stuff rather old? Why are we talking about slavery? Well, we have to talk about slavery because they're pulling down Confederate monuments. And the reason they're pulling down Confederate monuments, now you'd like to say that the Democratic Party is having a moment of conscience. The Democratic Party is saying, you know what? We did a lot of terrible things in American history. We actually were the party protecting slavery. And so we can't stand these reminders of slavery, so we've got to take these monuments down. That's because we're acknowledging our history for the first time. We're admitting it. We're apologizing for it. That's not what's going on, is it? What's going on is what I want to call, my new book is called The Big Lie, because there's a big lie going on. And the big lie is, let's take all the blame for what we Democrats did and put it on the South. That's why no one's pulling down Stephen Douglas's monument in Chicago. That's why no one is going through West Virginia and pulling down all the monuments of Robert Byrd, longtime member of the Ku Klux Klan. He's not being targeted. Now, again, let's talk about the national anthem for a minute. America did this, and America did that. Actually, America did nothing. America doesn't do anything. Some Americans do stuff, and other Americans stop them. So let's talk about which Americans did what. And let's begin by going after slavery. So I want to suggest that after slavery, the Democratic Party almost unanimously opposed the 13th Amendment, freeing the slaves, I believe unanimously opposed the 14th Amendment, granting equal rights under the law, and I believe unanimously opposed the 15th Amendment, granting blacks the right to vote. This was the official position of the Democratic Party post-slavery. The Democratic Party is also responsible for every segregation law in the South, without exception. All those laws were passed by Democratic legislatures, and signed by Democratic governors. And so, when you hear about the legacy of segregation, once again, there's not a lot of blame to go around. One party did it all, and the other party tried to stop them. The Ku Klux Klan was founded by Nathan Bedford Forrest, with some other guys, a delegate to the Democratic National Convention. Shortly after he started the Klan in the 19th century, the Republicans shut it down. The Ku Klux Klan ceased to exist until 30 years later it was revived by one of the progressive icons of the 20th century, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson screened a pro-KKK movie to his cabinet in the White House and the Klan saw a, ma a massive national revival going way beyond the South. There were Klan chapters in Indiana, in Maine, in California. Who did that? Woodrow Wilson did that. Why don't we know that? Because someone has kept you from knowing it. Now, according to the progressive historian Eric Foner of Columbia, now close to retirement, I believe, Foner says in his book on Reconstruction that for 30 years, quote, the Ku Klux Klan was the domestic terrorist arm of the Democratic Party, end quote. If you look at the Klan in the 150 years of its existence, virtually every single Klan leader in states and nationally has been a Democrat. So you can go around shouting the name David Duke all you want, but David Duke is an extreme anomaly. Virtually every Klan leader has been a Democrat. Now, again, you might say, 
We're still talking about it a long time ago. Isn't it true that the Democrats redeemed themselves by doing the civil rights laws of the 60s? No, that's not true. More Republicans proportionally voted for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Bill of 1968 than Democrats did. If you doubt me, look it up. Look it up. If the Congress had had no Republicans, if you had only Democrats, none of those laws would have passed. The opposition to the civil rights movement did not come from the Republican Party, it came from the Democratic Party, from the racist wing of the Democratic Party, the so-called Dixiecrats. And here we have a progressive counter-move that needs to be noted. The party switched sides. The Republicans became Democrats, the Democrats became Republicans. Now frankly, to anyone who has lived through American politics, if anyone says this kind of thing, you can realize on the face of it, it makes no sense. This is like somebody who literally would come to you and say, you know what, at a certain date in the 60s, the cops and the criminals switched sides. The cops all became criminals. The criminals all became cops. Now on the face of it, you'd be like, really? Certainly the burden of proof is on the guy who says that, to show that that actually occurred. The beauty of this kind of nonsense is that you can test it out and you can check me out. So, go to your phone and enter the word Dixiecrats and all their names will come up, a whole roster of them, and then simply ask the following question to Google, how many Dixiecrats, how many racist Dixiecrats became Republicans? And I will help you out by telling you the answer in advance. One guy. One guy. Strom Thurmond. That's it. Every other racist Dixiecrat remained in the Democratic Party and was lionized in the Democratic Party to their deaths. There are Senate buildings named after them. As I mentioned, half of West Virginia is named after Robert Byrd. Robert Byrd Highway, Robert Byrd Medical Center, Robert Byrd this, Robert Byrd that. Notice no Antifa guys are pulling down his statues. Why? Because if you're a Democrat, you get to be in the Klan. Bill Clinton was at Robert Byrd's funeral in 2010 and he basically said, don't be too hard on old Robert Byrd for being in the Klan. You had to be in the Klan in those days to advance in the Democratic Party. End quote. True, true statement. You had to be in the Klan. Now, the parties did not switch sides. Blacks did become Democrats. They used to be Republicans. Guess when they switched? in the 1930s. Look it up, in 1936, FDR got 71% of the black vote. Overwhelming majority. Why? Because of the economic benefits of the New Deal. It had nothing to do with race. The, the, the Democratic Party in 1936 was indisputably the party of segregation and the KKK. Blacks were going from the party of Lincoln to the party of the KKK. Why, again? I don't blame them. This was the, the Great Depression. Everybody was under severe economic strain. The benefits of the New Deal, however meager, were an incentive. But what I'm saying is this was not a switch produced by race. And the South, which was democratic for a long time, did become Republican. When was that process completed? In the 1980s, in the Reagan era. So was Reagan campaigning on bigotry? No. Reagan was campaigning on patriotism, on free markets, on Christianity, on anti-communism. Here's what I'm saying. If you do a chart of the South, you will see that through the 20th century, the South becomes less and less racist. There is no dispute on this data. There's a volume of it. As the South becomes less racist, it becomes increasingly Republican. So the racism of the South runs in inverse relationship to its affiliation with the Republican Party. And when people talk about Nixon's Southern strategy, oh, Nixon appealed to the Deep South by appealing to bigotry. No, Nixon was from California. You think Nixon didn't know that if he made racist appeals to the Old South, he would lose the rest of the country? Nixon knew that. Nixon did not appeal to the Deep South. He didn't win the Deep South. Who won the Deep South? 
George Wallace. Segregation now, <coughs> segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, and Wallace was a Democrat. Nixon won the Upper South. Nixon appealed to non-racists in the Upper South. Now, this is by way of a brief introduction to the race debate. And I want to pivot and talk a little bit more about a related debate, which is the fascism debate. The fascism debate. Because since Trump's election, we've been hearing a lot, Trump's a fascist, the conservatives are fascists, the GOP is the neo-Nazi party, and all of this is based upon a big lie that goes long before Trump. In fact, it goes right back to World War II. And the big lie is simply that fascism and Nazism are on the right. They're right wing. Now think about it. When people say this, they very rarely explain it. They just assume it. And in fact, so powerful is this big lie that many people who don't know better, including me, until recently, believed it. Oh yeah, fascism. Communism is left wing. Fascism is right wing. Now, superficially, I ask myself, where did I get that idea? And I know where I got it. I got it from World War II itself, because the Soviet Union was on this side, and the fascists were on that side. So I figured if the, if the communists were on the left, the fascists must be on the right. And at that time, I wasn't smart enough to realize that actually, <coughs> sister ideologies sometimes have very bitter fratricidal wars against each other. Consider, for example, the Catholics and the Protestants. Or consider the Shia and the Sunni, who are both inside the house of Islam. They agree on 99% of their beliefs. Their disagreement is only over the baton of secession, and yet they've been fighting for centuries. So the fact that two guys are fighting does not in any way prove, or even suggest, that they must be ideological opposites. Sometimes they are competing for followers, for territory, for power. Once I began to research fascism, I realized that fascism has always been on the left. In fact, it was on the far left. Mussolini was the most famous Marxist in Italy. When he founded the fascist party, he got a letter or telegram of congratulations from Lenin. Why? because Lenin recognized Mussolini as a fellow revolutionary of the left. What was Hitler's party called? The National Socialist Party. Now remarkably, today, the socialism has somehow been taken out of National Socialism. And all that's left is the nationalism. And so the left is able to say, well, Trump's a fascist, look, he's an ultra-nationalist. Trump wants to make America great again. Didn't Hitler want to make Germany great again? Now, while nationalism is in fact a descriptive feature of fascism, it is, it's actually not a defining feature. In other words, when you have an ideology, you have things that are central to it and things that are sort of incidental. Okay, let's look at nationalism for a minute. I'm from India, I mentioned. Gandhi was a nationalist. Mandela was a nationalist in South Africa. All the anti-colonial leaders, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, were nationalists. Stalin was a nationalist. So was Abraham Lincoln, by the way. So was Winston Churchill. Now, are all these people fascists? No, obviously not. So the equation between nationalism and fascism is stupid. It's not a real equation. It is an effort to smuggle something over that isn't actually the defining feature of it. If you want to know what fascism is, Mussolini tells you. Mussolini is the founder of fascism, by the way, not Hitler. Mussolini came to power in 1922, Hitler came to power in 1933. Hitler looked up at Mussolini. Mussolini was the first, uh, set up the first fascist regime in the world. So Mussolini goes, this is what fascism is, everything in the state and nothing outside the state. For Mussolini, the state is kind of like an organism, a living creature. And all of us are cells inside of it. The cell is irrelevant, it's unimportant, it has no rights. The only value of the cell is the degree to which it serves the organism, the state. So 
So I ask you, does the fascist credo sound like the platform of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? In the 2012 uh, convention, Obama unfurled the slogan, we all belong to the government. That is the exact opposite of America. America is, the government belongs to us. The government is actually here to serve us as individuals. The fascist credo is that the individual is insignificant, the individual is a drop of water inside that ocean that we call the state. Now, I want to look for a moment at what is happening on the campus today. Because if you look at these Antifa guys, they wear masks, they wear black uniforms, they carry bike locks and baseball bats as weapons. Their objective is to drive speakers off the campus. These guys are the exact physical and historical equivalent of Mussolini's black shirts of the 20s or Hitler's brown shirts of the 30s. That's exactly what those guys did. That's how they looked. That's how they talked. There's only one difference, and that is that the old fascists said, we're fascists. The fascists of today purport to be anti-fascists. And they say things like, we've got to get rid of hate speech. I listened to Ben Shapiro's talk at Berkeley. I didn't hear any hate speech. I heard a, a defense of modern American conservatism, which is nothing more than a, a defense of classical liberalism. If that's hate speech, it's not. There's nothing hateful about it. Now, what does this mean for us today? As I say, I've been throwing out all kinds of things. And I was a little hesitant to do it because what they say in persuasion is you cannot persuade somebody to change their worldview. You can't persuade them to take the whole lens out of the camera. You can persuade them to change their mind about this little thing or that little thing, and maybe that will later lead to a transformation. But I said to myself, that approach would work if there's another speaker coming in two months from now to Lock Haven. But since I'm the first speaker in, I believe, 14 years, you probably have to wait another 14 years before you hear a point of view that is out of sync with the reigning orthodoxy. And I just want to leave you with a thought. Is this actually what you're paying for? Is this what you actually call a liberal education? An education in uniformity? An education where some guy comes from the outside, it doesn't matter if he's a non-white immigrant, and tells you stuff that upsets you because your professors have been lying to you. Therefore, you're uncomfortable. Therefore, you've got to leave. You've got to drive them out. You've got to run for a safe space, take a bath, <laughs> smell a rose. <laughs> this is actually not what growing up is all about. Look, you know, college is that transitional point between being a kid, needing to be spoon-fed and taken care of. And college does a little bit of that, and that's okay. But the whole point of college is to get you ready for what is actually life itself. Here we are in life, and we are flung into the world. Nobody tells us why we're here. <coughs> Nobody tells us what's going to come after death. This is actually life. And adult life is the equivalent of that. You're prepared as well as you can, and you're going to be flung into the world. Don't go into the world of a buffoon. Don't go into the world having never examined your own thoughts, turned your assumptions into questions. That's really what college is all about. So in that spirit, I'm here to speak. Not to convince you that everything I say is right, you can check it all out for yourself. What I would suggest is to identify two or three of the most startling things that I've said that you say to yourself, this can't be right. And I'm telling you, it is right, but don't take my word for it. You verify it. And if you find out that I'm wrong, put it on social media because it will, it will go like wildfire. But if I'm right, then you have to ask yourself a different question. How is it that I can be 21 years old and consider myself a pretty smart guy or gal. And not only did I not know this, but it's like blown me away. 
I can't believe it. There's no way it's, it could be true. How could I possibly take that stance toward knowledge? You're almost acting like the guy, the Greek in the 5th century BC, where someone tells you, you know, there are more planets than the seven stars you see in the sky. And you go, no way. That can't possibly be true. Well, you can forgive the Greek in the 5th century because he had no method of discovering anything else. But you do. And at your fingertips to boot. So let me leave you with the idea that, for me, this is not an, uh, an argument, it's not a fight. It's part of an educational process of opening our minds. To me, one of the beautiful things about America, when I first came here, is simply the idea that people would question their own beliefs, and college is sort of based on that, and I love that. All my writing is based upon that. Even in my latest book, The Big Lie, I mean, I've been listening to all these big pundits. Rachel Maddow, Bill Maher, Chris Matthews, Van Jones. They blow me in about fascism since the election. Now I have a book out. All these guys know me. I've been on Bill Maher's show 30 times. But I can't get on any of their shows. They've all gone down major rabbit holes. Why? Because they don't even dare to put me on for 60 seconds for fear that they will look like complete fools. So the problems that we see at Lockhaven is are not unique. They're happening in the culture generally. And that's a very bad thing. That's a very bad America that we've gotten into where this kind of debate can occur. So you notice I'm not making the case for Trump. I'm not defending Trump. I'm just defending the right to knowledge, to historical truth. And I think America would make a lot of progress if the Democratic Party would simply say, yes, we are in fact the party of slavery, of segregation, of Jim Crow, of the Ku Klux Klan, of racial terrorism, and opposition to the civil rights movement. That is our actual history, and we are willing to admit to it. The moment we have that truth, the sky will part, and very good things will begin to happen. Thank you very much.